Welcome again to Know Your Bible. Today we're going to look at In the Beginning God Created and we're going to examine God's revealed purpose in creation. God has revealed that when he commenced his creative work as revealed in Genesis chapter 1, he had a specific purpose in mind. That purpose is referred to many times throughout the Bible. It is summarized in the following places. God says that he created the earth to be inhabited. God is determined that the earth will be filled with his glory. Jesus Christ says the meek will inherit the earth. And all things have been created for God's pleasure. From these statements, we clearly see that God had a determined purpose in creation, namely to populate the earth with people who will reflect his glorious character. It is foolish to deny the existence of God. Sadly, there are those who refuse to face up to the fact that God exists or acknowledge that he created the heavens and earth and mankind upon the earth. This class of person is spoken of in the Bible. We read, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. We read of those who, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools by denying the existence of God as revealed in his word. The Apostle Paul described the wonder of God's great works of creation to the pagan Greeks in Athens in Acts 17 verses 22 to 31 and it's worth reading and noting how Paul reasoned through his subject. As you read through at your own leisure, note the following points. Paul said that there was a God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth. He says he gives to all life, breath and all things. Also, he says, for in him we live and move and have our being, for we are also his offspring. And again, he says, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. And he has pointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all by the raising him from the dead. It must be understood that there is no scientific fact that can be advanced to prove evolution. It still remains a theory about how life came into existence on the earth. It is no different really from the theories of the pagan Greeks who believe that Zeus and Atlas and other mythological gods were responsible for the earth and life upon it. We will now look at the creation which covers Genesis 1 verses 1 to 2 and we'll examine the record of Genesis 1 and noting some of the important points associated with God's creative acts that are recorded here. Well of course we read in the beginning. We are not told when the beginning was, only that it was some period prior to those specific acts of creation recorded in Genesis. What we are told is that God existed before this point of time. In Psalm 90 verses 1 to 2 we read, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1, we read, The earth was without form and void. Another translation, Rotherham, has, Now the earth had become waste and wild. And it gives the idea that the planet earth had been created some time earlier, but for some unrevealed reason, had now become without form and void. It's pointless to speculate how or why this happened, as the reason is not specifically revealed in the Bible. The Hebrew word for without form is tohu, which means waste, or an empty space. Void in Hebrew is bohu, and means emptiness, and both these words occur together in Isaiah 34 and verse 11 and Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 23. We read that darkness was upon the face of the deep. Light did not penetrate to the earth's surface. In Hebrew, deep speaks of an abyss or a surging mass of water. The word occurs in Psalm 33 and verse 7 and Genesis 7 and verse 11. 
The Spirit of God is the power of God by which he performs his mighty works and sustains his creation. Again, the psalmist says, You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. From verse 3 to the rest of the chapter, we have the details of the six days of creation. There are six days in which God performs specific acts of creation. Each activity commences with the expression, And God said. As we consider these events, we are compelled to agree with the words of the psalmist, O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. And God said, When God speaks, his will is then done. The angels in heaven always do his will, as recorded in Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. And God said, let there be light. You know, some question where the light came from, seeing that the sun and the moon had not yet been placed in the sky. But we're told by Timothy that God is the source of light, both physical and moral light. So we read, God who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honour and everlasting power. Amen. Furthermore, his word is our source of enlightenment. Well, we read that each day had a was a 24-hour period. By the use of the phrase, and the evening and the morning were the day, whether it's the first day, the second day, etc., uh, right through the six days. And of course, this is the Jewish method of describing a day, from sunset through to the following sunset. Therefore, the evening from approximately 6 p.m. through the next morning and up to the next sunset is the period spoken of. There is no reason to reject the view that the six days are literal days of 24 hours. This is established by the Sabbath law which God gave Israel. And so we read in Exodus 20 and verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. These are the creative acts that happened on each day. From verses 3 to 5, we learn that on day 1, there was light and darkness. From verses 6 to 8, there was day 2, the establishment of Earth's atmosphere. From verses 9 to 13, there was day 3, the separation of water and land, vegetation and plant life. From verses 14 to 19, we have day 4, the positioning of earth in relation to other heavenly bodies to establish signs, seasons, days and years. From verse 20 to 23, day 5, the creation of birds and sea creatures. And from verses 24 to 31, day 6, the creation of animal life and mankind. And so God ended his work and he rested on the seventh day. But here's a point that we need to raise. What does it mean when the birds, the fish and beasts are called living creatures? In verse 24, we read, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. Well, they are made up of two Hebrew words simply meaning a living, natural animal body. These words are nephesh, from the Hebrew root meaning to breathe, and it means a breathing frame. And it is translated both creature and soul and life and person, and it is used importantly both of animals and man. It is also used to describe a body that is no longer alive. And the word kaim, or chaim, from the root meaning to live, is used together they become nephesh chayim, and it's translated living creature or living soul. The phrase is used of natural life of birds, fish, animals, and man in this record. And so we read in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29, 
to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. In these last few verses of chapter 1, we observe that man, the animals and birds were given the herbs of the, and fruit of their, for their food. We know that since the entry of sin into the world, this placid state has changed, and now both man and other creatures kill and eat meat. This change is specifically mentioned in Genesis 9 and verse 3. However, the Bible reveals that when the kingdom of God is established, this situation will be reversed. The chapter ends with this quote in verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. This statement indicates that the creation was in perfect harmony with the Creator. However, when sin entered the world, this good state was disrupted, and now the whole creation groans, says the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8. Harmony will only be restored when Jesus Christ returns to the earth.